provide affordable, high-speed internet for every American, rural, suburban, urban, and tribal communities. Could you say your name for me? My name is Doris McClure. What is the most important thing that you want the rest of the world to know about Utica? Utica is a unique town, um, good people, a good place to live. Uh, it's a good community. My name is Carlton Turner. Tell me a little bit about yourself. Well, I am part of eight generations of my people that have been in this community. I, I love Mississippi. Um, I'm uh, deeply uh, invested in the state. First name is Jean. Last name is Green. What do you love about Utica? I like the uh, people. Yeah. I like rural. I like not being cramped up on top of other folks. Uh, I like the feeling of the community around the campus and the town. Yeah. Allison, Allen. What do you love about Utica? Or what makes it special? I would say how we look out for one another. Like if one don't have, we reach out and we come together when some family is struggling or a death in the family or something like that. It's like, that's how we connect. We connect by love, giving. So my name is Olita Garrett Fitzgerald. Mississippi is home. Uh, my relationship to Mississippi is, is one of family and one of fight. I'm Phaedra Robinson. I've tried to leave a few times, it just didn't work out uh, because I, I really believe this is ground zero for any social justice issue that this country faces. My name is Veronica Lee. I grew up in this small town where y'all located. This is my small business, this restaurant. It's called It's an Art Kitchen. Do you have the internet? I do. Yeah, is it good? No, not at all. With all these, this rural area down here, and I don't know how many towers or whatever they have down here, it's not reliable. Anytime it rains, it don't even have to rain. Like um, Saturday, we had a bad wind come through. It knocked everything out, the lights, the internet, everything for hours. Have you read the article, The Land the Internet Forgot? Mississippi is the land the internet forgot. It feels like old dial-up. You can't get upset about it because you'll spend your whole day mad. You know, you realize, man, they can do so much better than what they're doing. The reason why we call it Messy Monday is because everybody Zoom try to get their Zoom calls to be their first day of the week. So that by the end of the week, yeah. we can just finish up. So Mondays, everything, everybody has Zoom calls. So it'd be super slow. I have been uh, Zooming. Uh, with our church ever since the pandemic hit. So that is how we stayed together, communicated. Now I still do some Zooming for those that can't get back in. Even if you're at home and you do have some Wi-Fi or a Wi-Fi you're trying to Zoom from, the infrastructure is not strong enough to pick up. You're just in and out. So with all the online classes that students are given now and your book is online, it's still a problem. So it makes education a problem because, you know, with the service you get in the book, the pages are not turning. You don't have the speed that you need. Uh, so you're just underserved. 
this campus, the Utica campus, uh, was its own institution at one time. It was Utica Junior College. And it has been a beacon of education for people in this area for a hundred years. When we first got uh, Wi-Fi on the campus, it really benefited the community more than it did the campus because there would be people lined up in cars across from my library at night getting the Wi-Fi because they couldn't get it out where they lived a mile away from the build, from the campus. So I see Utica's campus, this area, as being central to uh, access to information for folks. People in the community comes down sometimes. Even myself, if I'm, you know, you, I, you come down and you sit at a building trying to connect to Wi-Fi to get some service. Are there any local places where folks go to use the internet if they don't have it at home? Mm -hmm. The um, library, yeah. Utica Library. Okay. Um, does that create any challenges for folks? Like, yeah, I would say because it's small, yeah. and you probably it's only with probably with the still COVID thing going around, people don't want to be that close to people up under people. But it is kind of small, so you maybe have to rotate days with someone. Or in right now, right now they have a summer program for the kids going on, so you have to probably schedule a time to come in and, and use it. Well, for years, I've been trying to just reach out to some of the communication service, trying to see if we can get more Wi-Fi internet servicing out here. And we would call AT&T and talk to them about bringing communication through our town, some fiber. And how many years have you been trying to get that? Oh, probably 10, 15 years or so. So it's been a long time. When People say your zip code should determine your outcome. Right. It does in Mississippi, because if you're in a rural community, then you can't afford internet. Or if you can afford the internet, um, it is the strength of the system that you have. So you're paying an ungodly amount of money for a system that constantly fails or that is constantly buffering. And so that becomes problematic, or you're paying so much for the service that you can't afford a good device. I have had several professions in my life. The one that's lasted the longest was I've been a librarian for about 30 years. And I was um, director of libraries for this campus for 20 years okay. um, before I retired and decided to volunteer <laughs> and do this work. So I would say that if someone asks who she is, that she is a Mississippi woman who uh, feels and shares her history and uh, wants everybody to have access to whatever information they can get. How do you see yourself as a part of that Utica community now that you've been here for a minute and you're not? Yeah, I kind of see myself as one of the elders of the community. Um, and I still see myself as the keeper of the history. You know, if you just think back to the Jubilee Singers, you know, they were on the radio in New York City from this town in the 1930s. They were in New York City. There was somebody in the audience from WJZ Radio in New York City. And uh, WJZ was getting ready to start the National Broadcasting Company. And so they invited the Jubilee Singers to come to a Sunday concert on the radio. They had such a tremendous response and so uh, WJZ and NBC offered them a uh, recording contract for a weekly radio show called the Utica Jubilee Hour. And so even the Jubilee Singers, they, they were traveling and representing um, not just this, this community, but they were representing uh, black folks in, in the South. They were uh, one of the most popular African-American singing groups in the country. Over three million people a week listened to the Utica Jubilee Hour. They were based in Utica, Mississippi. You know, we're not asking for a pat on the back. We just want people to just remember that um, great contributions can come from anywhere. You know, Benny Thompson's from here. You know, he's from Bolton, but he went to school right now here. You know, Rod Page, who's the Secretary of Education, came from that school. 
we can go down a list of, of, of major players that have come through Utica. It really is about the, the foundation and the, the conditions that are being created on the ground. Uh, and Utica has a, a history of creating optimal conditions to create amazing people. Utica is not the average small town. It actually has, has a deep significance to the history of the state. Uh, at the bottom, you see, William Holtzfeld was the first black man in Mississippi to publish a book in 1915 mm. when he did his autobiography of Black Man's Birth. He took to heart what Washington told his students, which was go into the deepest, darkest places uh, that you could find and spread that information and lift that veil of ignorance from the grudge. So he set up a farmer's conference, which would train the local black farmers about uh, soil and how to improve their their uh, selves by getting multiple homes buying and on the land. You know, I know that here in Utica, you know, we had we had the railroad, we had the cotton gins, the the sawmills, we had you know so many. Uh, parts of the infrastructure for agriculture were right in the center of this town. And it meant that what our farmers were doing in this area were probably some of the leading practices in the state. Agriculture was the way of life. Washington, in the preface to uh, Hoslaw's book, talks about Utica being the best example of, of the Tuskegee model. Whatever the farmers were doing in, you know, the most modern means of production, they were right here in and around our community. The campus has always been kind of an early adopter of technology. In that picture of, of the office, Holtzclaw had one of the first phone systems in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a power plant here, he used electricity. Running uh, water. Running water, yeah, full, full thing. Uh, and he really was trying to build this campus as like a model that you could um, come and see, um, you know, what's possible and what, um, take your family farm and, you know, build a modern home. Utica is not an, uh, some crazy outlying town. It is, it has been the center uh, of so many achievements uh, for the state of Mississippi that have had national impact. We had the first paved road in the state of Mississippi was Main Street. Mm. The first radio station in the state of Mississippi was on Main Street. Our community is a community that has a long, uh, rich history um, as, a, as a cultural center. Utica was already thriving when uh, the school got there, mm -hmm. and it continued to thrive uh, up through the, when did they shut down the first place? Was that in the 80s? Mm -hmm. It had two high schools, it had three sawmills, it had, um, you know, a shirt factory, it had a doctor's office and, and dentists, and, you know, it just, uh, car, car sales spaces and, and, and clothing stores and department stores, it was, and that was when I was growing up, it's not like that was like in the 1800s or something, that was like, you know, in the 1980s. And you kind of fast forward uh, 30 years and you see a community that is drastically different. You know, like 1993, they closed the high school here, um, which was the high school that was part of the Hines County public school system. And when they closed that high school, you're basically cutting off a productive branch of your community, right? Industry started leaving the country okay. and leaving the area. Then it slowly started going downhill after that. In, in 1998, they closed the shirt factory. Well, the shirt factory was closed kind of during that NAFTA period in which they began to ship out those types of factory jobs out of the country because they could get cheaper labor outside of the country. It was a business decision made by the people who own the factory, but on our end, it was the loss of a hundred jobs that were, um, that were, it was a sewing factory. They were primarily, about 99% of those jobs were black women. So you have a hundred women that make the decisions for a hundred households about what they're gonna eat. And, and the grocery store across the street from where they work. So that it can't be any more convenient. So the grocery store is feeding off of that, the, that those 100 jobs that have 100, 100 women in our community, you know, engaging with uh, food. Uh, fast forward another, you know, a few years and they closed 
the second high school, which is the high school that's on the campus of, of uh, the community college. Yeah. From an identity standpoint, yeah. it is connected to the oldest black institution in the town. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So you're also losing part of your cultural identity. You're not just uh, educational space, but this is part of our legacy uh, that was lost in 2014, that same year, that fall, the grocery store died. When we lost the grocery store, I was like kind of crushed because after Sunday, I just knew I was going to that grocery store and going to buy something. Yeah. We'll get something to buy. Here we are in 2023, nine years later, um, and that grocery store felt like the final um, punch in the gut uh, of a community that was already struggling, and now we don't even have food. Um, in our community. Dollar General, it is there, but it's not like how Sunflower was. Sunflower, you had the deli in there, you had a cakery in there. Yeah. But like DG, you just, you just got a produce section. When that's gone, now you've taken, um, the, you, you basically ripped the, so, the last social piece from, from the community. That, that's, a, that's a big thing that we have to go places when we had it right here. So that's probably what frustrated me, like, not having what we used to. So I think uh, the struggle is about both what it means um, from a, a just vibrancy and just our town. What does it mean to be a town if you ain't got a grocery store? Yeah. Are we even a town? Yeah. You know, it becomes the question. So that kind of what amped me to do the things that, I'm, that I do just so I can give back and the next generation behind me yeah. won't have to lose something and then that's all they got is a memory yeah. of what Utica was or what people tell them Utica was. What that does to a community over time, it means that it actually is part of eroding democracy. People from Utica, they have, we have big dreams, big hearts, and when we want something, we go after it. Utica is being relegated to decisions that is made about the community and not by the community. When Hostel came to Mississippi, he went up to the Mississippi Delta, up to Tunica, and he talked to white planners up there about having a school for black folks, and they said, they don't need to know how to read and write the pit cotton. These folks don't need to get on the internet to do their job. They're just distracting from their job. Mm. Why they need this kind of access? These kids don't need that information anyway. They ain't going to college. It's um, keeping your population ignorant, keeps them malleable, and, and uh, you can use them in whatever way you want. I, I think that's a national trend. I don't think that's just a Mississippi trend. Education was promoted as a hallmark of like our ability to participate at the highest level of society. The business model is like you're you're more valuable incarcerated, you're more valuable as a consumer. The people that we need to operate at the highest rungs of society we can source from anywhere in the world. So it's no longer about a nationalist frame. Um, it's it's it is the extension of the capitalist frame in which we can purchase whatever goods and services we need to still stay on top of the world, um, and it doesn't require us to invest in the people of this land. We started looking at uh, internet access. We've been talking about it for a while. Uh, that it really emanated from work that we were doing with the Southern Rural Black Women's Initiative. Uh, back in 2015, we commissioned a report across looking at rural counties in Alabama, Georgia, and Mississippi. But this guy pulled out maps of all of the counties where slavery was in the, in the South and overlaid them to uh, poverty levels in the South. And they were almost exactly an exact overlay. And I say that to say that there's not been a lot of interest in development in those communities that were where people were enslaved.
They're completely wrong. Right. They're completely wrong. We want to know that the maps that they're probably looking at so far, that would be a lie. That mean you coverage because you get money from that from individuals in those areas. Right. You you got that covered. Yeah. Covered, but that's not coverage yeah. as far as in assets. How are you going to find out information on how to vote? How are you going to find out information on uh, your health? How are you going to find out anything? And if I can keep all of these people confused and stupid, nobody's to challenge me. Generally, it's felt that once legislation is passed federally, that the job is done. But one of the reasons we're here is that uh, we know that that's only half of the job. The, uh, the most important part of that work is making sure those resources get down to the families that need them. If you give us the resources, we save ourselves. We have to continue to be disruptors. What I would like the people to know is that we're just looking out to bring more jobs in the community. Um, in, in order to have some of those things, we need some of the other things that the metropolitan cities are getting. We need access, we need infrastructure. Uh, better than what it is. And if I don't share and make sure that you know it, you know it, and the other people in the area know it, then no one will because I won't live forever. And what I don't want to happen is the stories that we collect and that we share die with me. Um, the way we have immortality is in the stories that are told about us, uh, in the stories that we share about the people that we know and love or that we meet, yeah. right? So to me, it's a, a mission to make sure that those stories are collected, shared, saved, and told. Oh, Mary, don't you weep, don't you moan, oh.